We are just traveling the globe this morning. We were in Sweden, we just came back from Italy, and now we're going to Canada. So my next guest is Jean Lamantia, and she is a uh, registered dietitian and author, a cancer survivor as well as a speaker. And Jean wrote about four different books. And I will tell you, the, this book here has everything you wanted to know about lymphedema. It also talks about the various wraps. A lot of the education that you're getting in these videos are in this book as well. And yes, in, in the back, there's actually some nutrition and recipe guides. But I'm going to leave that up to Jean to share with you um, her story and her knowledge as it relates to nutrition and uh, lymphedema. So Jean? Welcome. Hello and welcome. My name is Jean Lamantia. I am a registered dietitian. I'm also one of the co-authors of the Complete Lymphedema Management and Nutrition Guide. I'm the creator of an online program called Lymphedema Nutrition School, which is both a live and a self-study course. I have a virtual private practice and I'm a blogger at jeanlamantia.com. And I'm so happy to be speaking to you about nutrition for the lymphatic system. And I'd like to thank the Boston Lymphatic Symposium for inviting me to be a speaker. And let's get started. Uh, first of all, I have a disclaimer. This presentation is for educational purposes only. It does not substitute for an individualized nutrition assessment by a registered dietitian. And uh, financial disclaimer in that uh, because I'm the author of three books and a guide, I do make some uh, royalty on the sale of those items. The objective for my talk is I want you to be aware of the research related to lymphedema and diet uh, and be informed about other nutrition strategies that might benefit lymphedema, even if they're not published in the literature. Just things I've found through my own clinical practice, as well as just um, standard of care, current standard of care. And if you're a research geek like me and you want to actually read the studies, that I have a blog called um, Lymphedema Diet, and I've hyperlinked a lot of the research there. I have a few other blogs related to some of the other topics, um, but most of what I'm speaking about, you can find the research on my blog. All right, so let's get started. This is my agenda. I'll talk about um, weight loss, both as a prevention and treatment, show you the research there, show you the research on low fat diet. And really that's pretty much the end for what's been published in the literature in human studies. And I'm limiting myself to human studies um, when I'm sharing with the research with you. Then we'll talk about fluid, protein, and sodium. And then some other things that I've discovered, just you know, what makes sense based on the physiology of the lymphatic system, as well as what I've uh, discovered in my own practice. All right, in terms of weight loss for prevention, I'm not going to go into detail on all of the research, but suffice it to say that multiple studies have shown that body weight or weight gain is a risk factor for developing lymphedema. A lot of that research is done in the cancer community because they're trying to figure out why is it that some people get lymphedema after having lymph nodes removed and radiation treatment and chemo and others don't? And how do we predict and how do we help those people that might be at risk? And so having a high BMI has often come up. There are also studies um, just looking at BMI outside of the cancer community, in which case um, often they're looking at lower leg lymphedema, and they also show that BMI is a risk factor. But let's talk about how do we use weight loss as a treatment strategy? And there are five studies that I can show you and I'll just go through them just briefly. But as I mentioned, if you want the details, go to my blog. So this first one was 21 women who had breast cancer related lymphedema and they were put into one of two diets, either a weight loss diet, which was like a 1200 calorie diet, thousand to 1200 calories or control group, which was not a calorie restricted diet uh, for three months. And what happened? So the women in the weight loss group, they did lose weight anywhere from around two pounds to 13 pounds and the control group, no weight loss. But when they did a measurement called excess arm volume, so they specifically recruited women who had lymphedema only in one arm. So then they could measure how much size 
um, reduction there was in the healthy arm, and then how much size reduction there was in the lymphedema arm and subtract them, knowing that the difference would be what they call excess arm volume, but that would actually reflect how much the lymphedema itself has gone down. So in the group that lost weight, um, they lost 228 mLs of um, the lymphedema fluid and the control group lost only 11 mLs. So it's almost a cup versus you know, two teaspoons. Same researchers uh, did this study, which was 51 women, but instead of just two groups, like a control group and a weight loss group, this one also had a third group, which was a low fat diet group. And in the low fat diet group, they instructed them, don't lose weight. We just want to put you on a low fat diet and see what effect that has. However, what happened was some people in the weight loss group didn't lose weight, people in the low fat diet and the control group who were not supposed to lose weight, lost weight. So then when they compared the results based on which group they were assigned to, they didn't see a pattern, but then they just said, well, let's just look at who lost weight. It doesn't matter how they did it and see if it had an impact on the lymphedema. And what they found was there was a significant difference between those that lost weight and those that didn't, despite whatever study group they were originally assigned to. So we have a second study then confirming that weight loss has helped reduce lymphedema. This third study is, um, was presented at one of the conferences that I was at, and there was four treatment groups. So just a control group, who went to a facility for exercise and weight loss program, or they did an exercise program at home, or they did a nutrition program at home, which was Nutrisystem for 20 weeks and then um, you know, support um, meetings, or exercise and nutrition at home. And they were very successful in losing weight. They lost 8% of their body weight in either the, the diet only or the diet and exercise. But surprise to uh, everyone, it did not translate into an improvement in lymphedema. So the researchers thought that perhaps the exercise changed the arms in a way that made measuring the amount of lymphedema difficult to do accurately. I have my own theory about this one, which is, I wonder if they maybe lost weight too quickly, and they were maybe a victim of their own success. But um, I don't know what the rate of weight loss was, because they only presented it as a percentage. But that would be my educated guess there, you know, something to consider. Weight loss study number four was 12 people, uh, 11 women and one man with lymphedema. And they, they began a lifestyle modification program where they met every week and they were um, allowed to choose if they wanted to do a ketogenic diet or not. And I put the words ketogenic in quotations here because if you read the study, one of the um, diet instructions were to eat as much protein as you want. Uh, that's not a true ketogenic diet. And also they didn't measure them for ketones. So in my mind, as a dietitian, a ketogenic diet means a diet that is restricted enough in carbohydrate and protein and high enough in fat that your body actually starts producing ketones. So that's what those quotations mean. Uh, but anyway, it was a low carb diet. We know that. Um, and they also, they didn't do food records. So there's not any sort of double check that they're actually eating what they said they were. Anyway, nine people lost weight and the weight loss did can correspond to a loss of lymphedema volume. And the people who did the quote unquote ketogenic diet did lose more weight. That's consistent with other research. We know that people who are on low carb diets lose more weight out of the gate, but it really does level out by six months or a year. If you want to read more about that study, I have a specific blog on that one. And then weight loss study number five, this was the most recent one. This was a 2020 publication uh, from Iran. It's 88 women with breast cancer, lymphedema in one arm, and they were on a low calorie diet. So they took whatever their normal intake is, and they subtracted between 500 and 1,000 calories. And then they gave them either a placebo pill or they gave them a symbiotic supplement. A symbiotic is a combination of probiotics. So like, for example, lactobacillus acidophilus is a probiotic. So it's a live bacteria. So there was several different um, 
strains, about six or seven different ones, and a prebiotic. So a prebiotic is a type of fiber that the bacteria that live in your intestine ferment or use for energy or fuel. Okay. And in this case, it was something called fructo oligosaccharide. Um, it was a double blinded study. So the researchers didn't know who got the symbiotic and the, and the, the study participants didn't know either. And what were the results? There was a significant reduction in tumor necrosis factor alpha and leptin. So these were a couple of blood measures they're looking at, which are indicators of inflammation and um, uh, satiety hormones. And when they compared the, um, the symbiotic group to themselves, because they took measurements at the beginning of the study and then at the end, like 10 weeks later, they found um, there was a significant reduction compared to themselves uh, in the lymphedema volume. So it really did seem to be helping, but no significant difference in terms of body weight, percent uh, body fat, um, interleukin-1 beta, which is another measure of in inflammation, as well as um, HSCRP, which is high sensitivity C, high sensitivity C reactive protein. So um, the symbiotic did appear to help people lose lymphedema volume, but of course it was combined with weight loss. So we're not sure exactly um, the, the additional contribution, but very interesting study, which um, if I had more time, we could explore around the GI system. But today I'm just introducing you to the different research that's available for lymphedema. Let's talk about low fat diet as a treatment. So before I do that, I just want you to understand how fats are digested and absorbed. So after you eat your meals, let's say you have a sandwich and you know you chew that up, swallow it, goes down the esophagus into the stomach where some digestion is taking place. And then it gets dripped into the intestines. And that's where the bulk of digestion and absorption is happening, right? So the body is breaking down carbohydrates into single sugars. It's broken, breaking down fats into amino acids and it breaking down fat, sorry, protein gets broken down into amino acids. And then fats are broken down into fatty acids. So fatty acids are chains of carbon. So you have carbon, 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 all hooked together with some hydrogen bonds. Now, some of these carbon chains are short. So there's six carbons in the chain. Some are medium up to 12 and some are long. So longer than 12. The short and the medium chain fatty acids are absorbed directly from the small intestine into the portal vein. So that's it. They're absorbed into the body. They're in the bloodstream. Long chain fatty acids cannot be absorbed here. They continue down and they get put into something called a chylomicron. I think of this as a, like a fat transporter sphere. And that chylomicron goes through the lining of the small intestine. And those cells are called enterocytes. And if you look here on this magnified image, you see the large lacteal. So lacteal is a lymphatic capillary that's in the intestines. This word lacteal might remind you of the word lactease or lactase or lactose, or if you speak French, it might remind you of the French word for milk, which is lait. Now, why does it have a word that's reminding us of milk? And that's because it's a milky white substance. It's different from the lymphatic fluid in the rest of the body, which is more clear. It's more like plasma. In the GI system, it's milky white because it has long chain fatty acids in it. And those long chain fatty acids are transported through those lymphatic capillaries. They join up with other capillaries, which eventually get larger and join up to vessels and which come all the way up the central trunks and are absorbed up here with the subclavian veins. So the long chain fats take a very long circuitous route to get absorbed into the bloodstream. And this is very relevant um, for lymphedema. Now, where are the long chain fats in the diet? So butter has a little bit of short chain. Um, MCT oil is 100% medium chain. I'm just going to explain what that is. Coconut oil, 64. Palm kernel oil is 55. Butter is seven. And all the vegetable oils that we know and love are 100% long chain fatty acid. Now, let me be clear. This doesn't mean that they're bad. Okay. And the reason we're talking about chain length is only because you have lymphedema. 
it's not related to heart disease risk or cholesterol levels or anything. For that, we look at other measures like, is it an omega-3 or an omega-9 double bond, for example? Okay, um, let me just clarify one thing here. So this is the palm fruit. The palm kernel oil comes from the nut and the palm oil comes from the flesh. So you see here, palm kernel oil is 55% medium chain, whereas palm oil is 100% long chain. So why does this matter? Uh, oh yes, before I get, answer that, MCT oil, what they do with that is they take coconut oil or palm kernel oil or combination, and they separate the long chain fatty acids from the medium chain. And then they put the medium chain in a bottle and they call this MCT oil. So MCT stands for medium chain triglyceride. So in this bottle, or these bottles, these are just samples. Um, it would be 100% medium chain triglyceride. So no long chain. So in other words, they don't require the lymphatic system for absorption. So let's look at just a case study with two people in it. So this was two women who had lower leg lymphedema and they were put on a low fat diet. So they were told less than 20% of your calories can come from fat. And if you want to calculate that, there's lots of apps that you can use where you put in your intake and it'll calculate what percentage of your calories come from fat. Plus they were allowed to use MCT oil. So patient A was overweight and lost 22 pounds and reduced prim the perimeter of both of her thighs. She had a seven centimeter reduction. Sorry, this should say in her, yes, in her lymphedema leg, a five centimeter reduction in her healthy leg. So for a net reduction in lymphedema of two centimeters. Patient B who did not, need to lose weight, so maintain their weight, but still lost three centimeters in the lymphedema thigh. So the low fat with MCT seemed to be helpful. This is a clinical trial with 10 women with upper arm lymphedema following breast cancer surgery, lymph nodectomy, radiation, and chemo. They were just sent home with a bottle of oil. Here, use this as your main cooking oil. And one group got corn oil and one group got MCT oil. And they all had... Um, the same physical therapy, which I think was probably um, lymphatic therapy. Um, the corn oil group gained 75 mLs of volume and the study group lost 200 mLs with a significant difference in the feeling of arm heaviness. Now, the one thing I need to tell you is that MCT oil can't tolerate a very high heat. So if you're inspired to you know, take this home and start working with it, um, it can't be used in every single application. Let's move on to just current standard of care. So when it comes to fluid, protein, and sodium, we do not restrict fluid and lymphedema. This is unlike, for example, if you have congestive heart failure, or if you have um, liver uh, ascites or other edemas, it's very common to restrict fluid, but not the case with lymphedema. Protein is also not restricted. And sometimes people might think, well, lymphatic fluid is high protein. Maybe I should restrict it. No, the, the belief there is that it will further concentrate the lymphatic. Um, sorry, if you restrict protein, albumin can drop, which um, albumin is an important blood protein and it pushes against the wall of the blood vessel that applies pressure. And if there isn't that pressure, then it's thought that more fluid could could leak out of the blood vessels, which would create more lymphedema. But sodium, we do restrict. So that's across the board with all types of edema. Let's move on to just some ideas that make sense based on physiology and that I've also tested. So this, um, this is just a quote I pulled out from this paper. Uh, total lymph formation in humans is approximately one to four liters a day, most of which more than 50% is formed in the GI tract. So that got me thinking, well, maybe if we give that GI tract a rest, will that help? And there's a way to do that. And it's called intermittent fasting. And the specific form of intermittent fasting I'm thinking of is time-restricted feeding. And with time-restricted feeding, you basically think about you know, I have 24 hours in my day, I'm going to divide that 24 hours into an eating window and a fasting window. And so first step with that would 
to think about, well, when do I eat my breakfast? Like, when do I break my fast in the day? And when do I finish eating? Not just dinner, but is there a snack afterwards? Is there something I eat in the evening? When is that meal done? So, and then you calculate from the time that last meal is finished until you break your fast the next day, that's your fasting. Um, and you want to try as a first step, get that to 12 hours. So if you have your breakfast at 7am, you want to be finished eating by 7pm. And this is a strategy I've used with my students in lymphedema nutrition school, and it's worked very well. And then you can just sort of inch it down from there. Now, a lot of people who do intermittent fasting tend to focus on the evening. So they'll fast through breakfast, maybe have a late lunch and, and they'll have the bulk of their calories in the evening. It's actually ideal or, you know, better if you can sort of make the calories more um, towards the beginning of the day, particularly if your chronotype uh, is an early bird. So your chronotype is like, what's your natural body rhythm, right? So if you tend to be more of an early bird, you're better off shifting that. So in other words, cutting out the evening snacking and maybe making dinner earlier. So a 16-8 is a very common thing and, and quite doable, something you could work up to if it's appropriate. And remember, I'm not suggesting you do this because I don't know you. I don't know what medications you're on or what your issues are. Um, so, but what a 16, eight would be is that you have an eight hour eating window and a 16 hour fast. So any combination that's going to add up to 24 hours. And this quote here, in addition to feeding lymph flow is also elevated by acute and chronic inflammation and intestinal obstruction. So just two strategies that play off of that quote, one is have a regular bowel routine. And how do you do that? get your fiber. And where's that in? It's your whole plant-based diet, regular fluid intake, regular activity, possibly symbiotic supplement based on that earlier study. The other thing is an anti-inflammatory diet. So what's going on in lymphedema? The lymphatic vessels are malfunctioning. Lymphedema develops. The lymphatics fail to absorb or transport fat. Fat deposits are created. Those fat deposits send out signals in the body to say, create inflammation. That inflammation creates new blood vessels, but the structure and function of those vessels is altered. So then it's malfunctioning and you get in this vicious cycle. So we don't have research looking at an anti-inflammatory diet specifically in a population of people with lymphedema. However, there's lots of research that shows that people can lower their blood levels of inflammation by changing their diet to an anti-inflammatory diet. So that's another strategy I use. So what are the takeaways? Diet and nutrition can make a difference for you and your lymphedema. Absolutely. Okay. Tracking your diet and lymphedema can help you to know how your body responds to various things. Okay. So if you're taking measurements in your lymphedema, start adding some food records. Um, gradually implement the lymphedema nutrition strategies could help you. I don't ever tell people to go home and say tomorrow, okay, I want you on a low sal salt, high fluid, um, you know, regular protein, uh, low fat, anti-inflammatory, weight reducing diet. No, I don't do that. It's a step-by-step -step process. Now, here are the strategies, as I mentioned, weight loss, or I also consider health at any size. Weight loss is not the only way to help have a healthy diet. So you can have a low sodium, anti-inflammatory diet without focusing on calorie counting or weight or getting on the scale, a low fat diet, possibly with some MCT oil, getting sufficient protein, getting sufficient fluid, salt restriction, time restricted feeding, regular bowel routine, anti-inflammatory. And if you need help with this, because we can all know this, we can all know what to do but the implementation is maybe where you struggle or the motivation, or you need the accountability, then you can work with the registered dietitian. Okay. So you can do that. You can track your intake and your lymphedema for more information. Probably the two books that would be most relevant would be this one, the complete lymphedema management and nutrition guide, as well as complete intermittent fasting. If you're a cancer survivor, then these two are also excellent resources. And then if you want to work with me in a more 
regulated way. Then I have a program called Lymphedema Nutrition School. There's a live version. We meet live on Zoom. So we're not live in the same room, but I'm there. People ask questions in real time. Or there's a pre-recorded version where people work through the lessons, set goals on their own. And that's called Lymphedema Nutrition School. And these are just some of the blogs that I've written on topics related to lymphedema or anti-inflammatory. So definitely check out my website if you want. You can sign up and then you won't miss a blog. You'll get an email notification when a new one comes. Thank you for your attention. I know this was quick, um, but I wanted to finish within the time limit that was, was given to me. But I also didn't want to lose leave anything out. So just suffice it to say, nutrition can help you and your lymphedema. So pay attention to what you're eating. And thank you for your attention. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak. Thank you, Jean. I just find that so fascinating. So, so fascinating. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have some questions that came in. Can you address sugar, alcohol, and caffeine related to lymphedema? All right. So there's no specific research on any of those elements in a lymphedema population. But I can tell you that anecdotally, you know, what I hear from my clients, what I see, you know, in the Facebook groups and the online communities is that those are all triggers that people have identified. So I definitely, you know, in my lymphedema nutrition school, I actually use this tool, I call it the trigger tracker. So I have people write down what they're eating. Um, and I get them to measure their lymphedema, or if they're not using a tape measure, then to at least use, let's say like a one to 10 scale or use a descriptive, um, words to say something like swollen today or feels good, or it's okay. Or, you know, and then look, what are your triggers? Right. And identify like, you know, if I have that second coffee in the afternoon, is, does my leg feel bigger? If I, if I go out and have alcohol, is there an impact? And what alcohol, you know, maybe something like a liquor with a mixed drink, which has maybe, let's say you're using Coke or ginger ale, a higher sugar content, maybe that would bother you more. Or, you know, so definitely know that those have been identified by other people with lymphedema, and they could very well be a trigger for you too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I noticed that, especially after the holidays, when I have a little too much holiday cheer, I notice that I flare up more than than I normally do. So yeah, I'm going to attribute that to the alcohol and the extra desserts I have. Um, can you talk about uh, how about avo avocado oil? All right, so this really gets into the information around anti-inflammatory diet. So I mentioned that fats are made up of fatty acids. And one way to categorize those fatty acids is to say, well, how long is the chain length? All right. Another way is to say, does it have a double bond? And where is that double bond? So if you have a carbon chain, and it has a double bond in it, that carbon chain has an alpha end and an omega end. And you count from the omega end one, two, three, if it's the double bond at the three, that's called an omega three. If the double bond is at the six carbon, it's an omega six. If the double bond is at the nine, it's called an omega nine. And it turns out that little bit of change in chemistry really changes the way it works in our body. So an omega three and an omega nine fatty acid are very anti-inflammatory, whereas an omega six is inflammatory. So when it comes to avocado oil, uh, its dominant um, fatty acid is an omega nine. So that would classify it as anti-inflammatory. It's not the highest. Uh, olive oil is higher. So I always figure, well, why would I use like the number two oil when I could use the number one, but maybe for certain cooking applications, you'd want to use it, but it certainly would be a good choice. That is so fascinating. Okay. And then what, I know we're short on time here. Uh, one last question, those weight loss studies that you discussed, how was the lymphedema volume measured? Um, going from memory here. Mm -hmm. I think uh, a, a variety of methods, I think some might have used bioelectrical impedance, but I think most of them just use a basic tape measure. Some of them I think might have even used the water overflow. 
Okay. Um, but I do have them linked on my blog. Okay, great, great. I think that does it. It's um, thank you so much, Jean. We really appreciate your time. That was so informative. And um, I, I like that tracker idea. I'm going to start doing that. So thank you so much. Great. great. And I'll see you in the, uh, the, the breakout session. Breakout. Yeah. 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 yeah.